Let's see. Hello. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. It looks like our stream is live on YouTube. Thank you for the delay. If you're watching live, this is the Mind Meld Live with Shell Protocol. I'm Cairo, and uh, I'm going to be kind of taking a backseat today because um, Kenny is ready to dive in with uh, Nitty Gritty with our guests. So I will let Kenny take it away. Hello, I'm Kenny, uh, and I'm very excited to have Jason Milionis with us today. Uh, Jason is an up-and-coming researcher in the crypto economic space, um, in particular in the decentralized mechanism design area. He's a second-year PhD student from Columbia University uh, CS department. He's advised by Tim Ruffgarden, who is the head of research at A16Z Crypto, and also by Christo Papadimitriou, uh, who is a leading complexity researcher. And he, uh, Jason has a broad range of interests uh, from game theory, machine learning, and blockchain. In particular, uh, he's already made some very big contributions uh, to research in the DeFi space. Um, one of the biggest contribution he's, he's made to date that's gotten like a lot of attention is this concept of loss versus rebalancing, AKA lever. And that'll be one of the main focuses of our talk today. Jason, it is a pleasure to have you. Thanks, uh, Kenny. Thanks, Kyra. It's nice to talk to you. Thank you for inviting me. Definitely. All right. So to get us started, maybe you could give us a little bit of background about yourself in particular, like what drew you to academic research and what drew you to crypto? Yeah, yeah, of course. So um, I'd say I'm generally um, very motivated to like um, um, do research because I think that in order to advance the state of the world and basically um, humanity in general, the only way to fundamentally do that is through research, like um, practical implementation of, um, um, of things is very important. And it's also the, the only way that you can get real world contributions as well. But I believe that um, all of these fundamental contributions um, should first pass through um, the research states that are uh, then staged for, uh, for production. So I'd say that this is in general what um, draws me to academic research. One more thing is also that um, you generally have the freedom to uh, make contributions on things that might not be considered to be important in practice. So basically you have this um, broadly known um, academic freedom to, um, to basically explore subjects that might not be um, of interest to the public yet. And there is, um, there is, a, there is a very good reason why that's, uh, that's the case. And basically um, that's the case because um, you never know what you will um, uncover in, um, in fundamental and in particular in theoretical research that I'm in. So I guess that's what I, I like the most about um, academia and uh, research in general. And I think there is um, huge interplay with uh, practice in both ways. So both theory affects practice and practice affects theory. Um, so I think that's, that's important for me. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you knew what you were going to find, it wouldn't be research. Um, yes, exactly. Uh, by definition. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so what about uh, like the crypto economic space, or as you you described it, the decentralized mechanism design space? Um, what what kind of drew you to to do research in that field? Yeah, so I think um, in terms of research, basically, um, I think my goal in, in blockchain and, and the crypto world more generally is to um, set the field of um, um, of mechanism design basically on on a, on a strong uh, mathematical footing in the in the decentralized setting, something which I don't think is really um, the case nowadays. Although I have happily noticed that it has increasingly uh, been becoming so, and this is a very welcome development from uh, from my side, I think. Um, but in general, to the more general blockchain setting, I think what drew me to it is um, basically that I've um, I've steadily, slowly, and steadily seen that it's essentially the uh, the great melting pot of game theory. So basically, um, the incentives that um, that are at play at this scale are, are quite impressive, and um, as well as well as the the wide variety of games that we um, notice. So it's not it's not you know ad auctions, for example, where uh, essentially you know the format that's going to be used, where we've replayed this type of game a million times in our heads. 
it's like in this space we have new games, we have complex games, we have exciting games, and this is what I like the most about this space, uh, the landscape of solutions that it allows you to, to implement, kind of. I want to uh, mention really quickly to our viewers, if you're here, uh, you can join us in the Mind Meld chat channel on our Discord. That's where we're following along. If you want to ask questions, comment, uh, join the Shell Discord, which is newly not hacked. And um, you can drop your comments and questions there. Yeah, I, 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 I what you said about mechanism design really resonated with me, Jason, because, yeah, like there's, there's, I think there's a, uh, it's like a confluence of factors as to why this is like a kind of like a, I don't want to call it a golden age of mechanism design research because you can't too early call, but it feels like it, like we're we're entering one. And one of the reasons why is because everything is so new. And whenever you have a bunch of new things, that's like, that's not just like a theoretical like idea, but like you actually, there's like billions of dollars like moving around according to these mechanisms. That's like a great place for, for any kind of, for research in general. And then on top of that, it's like in like the TradFi like meat, meat space, as people like to call it, like you you have these like social constructs we call like laws. Uh where we all kind of just like agree that this is like how we enforce things. But like in the decentralized space, it's really just computer code and, and economic incentives is pretty much like the bedrock of how we enforce things. And it makes mechanism design to me seem like not just a way, like, like an ad auctions, not just a way to make more money for a company, but like a way to actually like organize the complex system of, of agents, AKA like DeFi. I think in general, the purpose with um, both law and what we're doing as well is basically the, uh, the alignment of, um, of humanity, essentially like the we all seek to to improve the world, so I think that's um, that's that's a common uh, given in both. Uh, but I do agree that you know um, the crypto community has more of an uh, experimentational character than uh, than traditionally traditionally known. This can be both a good thing and a bad thing as well. Uh, so <laughs> let's not um, overstate things, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. There's definitely definitely risks associated in the space and. Um, in some ways, I feel like the crypto community is doing like a public service for for the rest of society, sort of sort of being at the the tip of the spear in a lot of these like experiments, um, getting to validate and invalidate ideas empirically, maybe ideas that could have been invalidated theoretically if we just spent more time thinking about it. But anyway, That's uh, right, yeah. so. I, I got, I feel like we, we try to ask all our guests this. So like, how often do you personally use like crypto, DeFi, like Web3 um, uh, apps, protocols, products, et cetera? Yeah. Um, I think that, um, you know, as I said, like what's important to me about crypto is essentially the technical side of it. Like it's the game theory implementation machine, basically. Um, but um, as to comes to how I use it, um, I don't think that I, um, I, I use it so, um, so frequently. And that's, um, that's basically something that I think is uh, tangential to, um, to my research. So, um, that's of course my, my take as a, um, as a theoretical researcher. Um, I tend to mingle with, uh, empirical stuff, but not so, not so much actually, um, actually using them. I, yep. I'm, I'm not too different from your approach. I feel like since I'm more on the implementation side, it behooves me to actually, I mean, I have to use it just, just for work, but um, I think, yeah. you know, hopefully if, you know, if, if collectively we do a good job, everyone is going to be using this, even if they don't know it yet. But I think the state of the art is not, is not there yet for people to actually make the, for have, have these products be something that people would widely use. Cause you know, they're, they're kind of mm -hmm. clunky, difficult and, uh, yeah, of yeah. course, but you know, there's 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 broader factors to using it. So beyond just um, I'm wanting to experiment with it, that um, you know, uh, it's not of of the time to to go into. I think, yeah. <laughs> so these these affect your your use of it for sure. Yeah, I'm I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna disagree with that statement. Um, okay, so moving on to loss versus rebalancing or lever. 
What was the inspiration for this research? What were the questions you and your collaborators had uh, at the outset? Yeah, so um, I think so. So we did this research with um, with great collaborators. So my my advisor Tim Rockgarden, who is um, professor of computer science at Columbia and um, head of research at A16Z, as you said, and um, with uh, Siamak Malemi, who is a professor of decision risk and uh, operation at uh, the Columbia Business School. And Anthony Zhang, who is a professor of finance at the uh, Chicago Booth School of Business. So where it all started is that we we essentially wanted um, better representations of um, of AMMs than than the CFMM primitive that we are currently have. So the constant level set curves uh, x y equals k as everyone uh, calls it. That's the preeminent one. So in the process of um, kind of doing that, we we saw that there is um, this amazing uh, interpretation that's uh, in what I call the price space, as opposed to the traditional reserves space that uh, we commonly think about. And so we think essentially that um, this alternative but um, equivalent parameterization of AMMs um, is essentially so that's what's essentially saying it's it's that it's in in terms of what um, what holdings the um, the AMM has at uh, at its implied pool price. So at its uh, spot price that the AMM is um, is reporting, and uh, the reason why it's important is, is because it, it it becomes natural to then ask what the price that the AMM reports it, um, at its uh, set of reserves, and so it turns out that um, this is a well-defined thing that you can compare to the external market price because you have now these these two um, um, prices, and so of course that's in the case where you have an external market price with a with a with an actual um, price, sometimes that's not uh, that's not possible. Um, like you know, very illiquid or long tail assets, you don't have a central market for those. Um, but essentially, you know, our exploration began from from this this primitive. Like we have these two um, these two prices. Why are they diverging? When they are diverging, and what are the forces that um, lead to their um, converging? If that um, if that happens, so our exploration began essentially um, as to fundamentally um, what you could do from the deviation of these two prices, and in particular, what are the profits that you could maximally extract from this, like purely from an informational perspective, because you have this mismatch between the two markets that um, that exist out there. Um, so if one of these two markets is is always ahead. Um, um, of the other, if, if we suppose, let's say that um, uh, you know the centralized exchange is um, the dominant one in in some um, asset class or whatever, um, then essentially it has always up-to-date information compared to the slightly stale price in AMMs. So the question, the basic question there is what 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 are the incentives of the various actors in this case that you have this um, this price deviation? How how do we think about this? So this is what inspired us to, to continue with this research, yeah. So when you say represent the AMM in price space, yeah. could you go into some a little more detail about that? In particular, like I'm assuming like price would be the X axis and then what would be the other axes in the price space? So basically, um, whenever you describe um, an AMM, you need, um, Two things to describe it um, that are the current state. Um, traditionally, these are the, the reserves, so how much of the token A you have and how much of the token B you have. That's uh, one representation that you could have. And of course, there's the um, you know the AMM constant and the, the famous K. That's essentially how much liquidity is there um, that's spread around uh, in the pool. But that essentially fixes the curve. We're currently saying about um, what's the state. Um, an alternative characterization of the state besides um, um, the X and the Y um, is essentially um, if you have the price and the liquidity distribution, that's that's the alternative reparameterization. So instead of looking at um, at the curve, you can imagine that you're looking at the tangents of the curve. Mm -hmm. So um, essentially, instead of just having the curve as a as a set of points that are the reserves, you can have the curve in terms of um, what um, one um, part of your axis is and um, and the, the slope of your tangent there. So the slope of your tangent there is famously related to, to what we call the implied pool price of the exchange. And that's essentially, it has the following meaning. 
if you were to buy an infinitesimal amount of, um, of the asset, so as small as possible, um, and as this quantity goes to zero, then essentially the marginal price that you get, this is what we call the implied bull price. And it turns out that you can do some math, and this is the, um, the negative of the, of the slope that you have essentially in this curve. So this is, this is an alternative reparameterization that you could have um, of an AMM, and it's something that we consider that's much more useful than the original um, reserves um, space um, reparameterization. That makes sense. So let me see if I understand you correctly. So like the, let's say you have, you know, token X and token Y. Token Y is, let's, the, the numerare asset or like the stable asset. So in practice dollars, token X, let's say is ETH or some volatile asset. And um, instead of representing like your typical bonding curve or whatever you want to call it in like reserve space where you have like how much X, how, how much X, how much Y, and then you find a point and you kind of, it, you basically say, okay, forget the numerare asset axes. Let's put price, which is the negative of the tan slope of the tangent line, which makes sense, right? Because you move along, like you move along that curve, you do some delta X or some delta Y, and the ratio between the two is like the price of your trade and like the infinitesimal price, instantaneous price. I think you said implied price. Okay. Yes. Implied yes. price is um you know the slope of that tangent line at every point and that sort of is and if you represent the amm in that way what does that what does that get you because because that sounds like that unlocks like some mathematical tools that otherwise weren't so obvious to use yes so you can now think just in terms of prices so you can now abandon the, the reserves or you can go back if that's useful and that's specifically useful in our case but more generally you can think now about um, moving between the states as moving between prices and uh, liquid distributions so um, but if we consider the simple case where you don't have any means or any burns of liquidity then essentially you can just consider that you are uh, you're moving um, around in prices so you have an external market with a price that moves around, of course, and you have this market, this new market, the AMM, that also you have now in this convenient representation where you have the prices that move around. So the question is, what's the relation of these, um, these two trajectories of, um, of prices in your market and the centralized market? Is, is there some relation to that? Um, and what can we get from this, essentially? And so what we, what we essentially realize is that there is a relation to that. And in particular, there are some actors that are called um, arbitrageurs that are financially incentivized to essentially make your, um, your price trajectory in your AMM match the one um, from the centralized market exactly in the case that they're not paying fees. In the case that they are paying fees, they don't match it exactly, but they match it almost exactly. So there is some, um, there is some band around which they... Uh, they tend to move, um, but they're financially incentivized to do that. And that's the final relation that you get between these actual um, price trajectories. And this interpretation is, is, um, is all unlocked because you have this, uh, this alternative price space reparameterization as we, as we like to call it. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, I feel like we want to, it's, if we're almost ready to get into like the definition and description of loss versus rebalancing, but maybe it might be helpful to um, go over like different types of order flow. There's like the uninformed or I guess order flow, AKA like noise trading. And then we also have like toxic order flow. So like what's, what's the difference between the two and why is uninformed flow good? And then why is toxic flow maybe bad or not maybe bad is bad yes so i think there's a little bit of um, uh, misinformation and disinformation in this regard at least um going around on twitter a little bit at some points that i had noticed so the term of uh, noise traders or uninformed order flow it's not meant as a diminutive term it's not meant to say that these people are, are dumb or are being taken advantage of and actually on top of this this is actually an, a wrong interpretation um, what it's solely meant to be is that essentially um, the uninformed order flow does not have short-term immediate market information. 
So long term, they might very well have information. And actually, this is the purpose of any efficient market. The purpose of any efficient market is to uncover and aggregate the long term information of its participants. So the, this uninformed order flow, they do have this, uh, this information just by virtue of being part of this market. What they don't have, though, is an immediate market edge. So the distinguishing bit is essentially whether someone has or doesn't have short term alpha. Uh, so, so the like, definition of uh, yes. So Warren, Warren Buffett would be uninformed flow. Yes, that even is though he correct. has clearly has long term at, at least <laughs> on 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 his uh, on his claims. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah, if we take him at face value, he would be uninformed. Yeah. Sorry exactly. To yes, that that is correct. And so you know, per this definition, it looks like this this informed order flow or like um arbitrary zeros as we call them. Um, it's kind of a tautology to to the toxic flow or the bad flow, because the only purpose it exists is essentially that it seeks to transact with you um, by virtue of having this short term uh, a superior market information. So it seeks to use this information only to extract pure short term profit from the AMM and nothing else. Um, that's the that's the sole reason of existence of the um, informed order flow. To, to extract profit right now. If, if, if they were not able to extract profit right now, it's not that they would behave in a different way, they would just disappear. The only purpose they exist is to take advantage of um, immediate profits. So, you know, so, so a common misconception there is that essentially um, with arbitrageurs, you're not playing a zero sum game. I've seen this in a couple of places. Um, I believe that in my view, this is, um, this is kind of incorrect. It's always a zero sum game with arbitrageurs. They can only gain from you because otherwise if they could not gain from you, they would not be there. So they would gain zero, let's say. There is no way they would gain a negative amount. They would just gain zero. If they, if they have nothing to gain, then they're simply not there. Kenny, you're muted. Thank you, Kara. That's a common, it's a signature candy move right there. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, because the, so the way, you know, I'm from more of a economics background, less from the, you know, mechanism design, computer science side of things. And like the way that like, you know, standard econ textbooks think about arbitrage is sort of like finding $100 on the sidewalk where it's like, you know, it's there and then it's going to get picked up really fast. And it's zero sum in the sense that like you're not gonna create like an extra hundred bucks like a, like like that hundred bucks fell out of someone's pocket, and now it's like a race to it's like who can pick it up the fastest and there mm -hmm. might be some benefits that arbitrage traders bring to the overall system efficiency, but from the point of view of like a market maker, whether you're a passive liquidity provider on a in an AMM in DeFi or like a high frequency market maker on a traditional exchange, it seems that arbitrage trades are exactly what you don't want. <laughs> you want to like sort of it seems like the game is um, to mitigate the impact of arbitrage trading and to maximize the revenue from uh from these uninformed orders yeah so basically i think the way i would phrase this is that this short-term alpha that the arbitrators can find it exists exactly because um the market is not efficient at this time moment so in this sense the arbitrators are performing important functions so essentially they're spreading market information to all venues they even out any any short-term discrepancies that exist and so basically the existence of, of, of this informed flow forces the markets in a, in a competitive way to be more efficient. So the only reason that th this flow exists is um, because the market is inefficient and um, it needs to be more efficient. If you could make the market more efficient on your own through, uh, through some design, then there is no, no reason for, um, for this flow to exist in, in this kind of sense. Um, but you know there is usefulness to this flow and it's making the market um, more efficient Forcing yeah, rather the market to be more efficient. Yeah, it's it's always great to know that like the price on the DEX is going to match the price on Binance more or less. Um, at least as far as like a, you know as a retail trader is concerned, you know if you're if you're like one of those MEV bots, then it's a completely different game you're playing. So, 
I think now we can talk about lever or loss versus rebalancing. Like, what is it? Like, how do we, what is it theoretically and how might we measure it empirically if we can measure it empirically? Yeah. So I think the way um, we're thinking about this is, um, let's think through this through the perspective of um, impermanent loss first, because I think that's the, um, the useful perspective you have. So an impermanent loss, which is um, it's another uh, commonly used metric that's uh, completely different from uh, from lever. You essentially focus as a liquidity provider on uh, on a binary choice. So as a liquidity provider, you're um, you have a bunch of choices um, essentially. Impermanent loss focuses on two choices of yours. You can either provide your liquidity on this AMM, or you can hold the position of these assets fixed, hold them as they are, and until some some future time, whatever, um, at which point you you decide to stop everything, let's say, and evaluate what you have. So you have, so from the perspective of impairment loss, you have this binary choice, um, nothing else. Now, what we are saying um, with our lever paper is that essentially, okay, um, listen, there's so many things that um, that a person could do. So why should my sole alternative be to just hold the position fixed? Like for example. If I might be a smart guy, I might decide to do all sorts of crazy things with my um, with my assets. So, what's the common factor essentially of all of these crazy things that I might decide to do? They all generally involve uh, involve what's called um, market risk. So, does the price go up or does it go down? Um, the idea is that essentially, for for the kind of um, comparison of liquidity provisioning to some other thing that you do, um, to be fair. It should be done in such a way that um, you can do this um, this crazy thing on the side separately from from your um, liquidity provisioning, and the liquidity provisioning itself should be separate from from any smarty strategy that you're trying to implement. So, in other words, essentially, you would like to evaluate um, providing liquidity on this market on its own as a standalone thing. You would like to remove all of the market risk because you're not um, you you want to play this game separately um, from that, or or alternatively, you have um, infinitely many options that you could do. Uh, so essentially, this gives rise to to our metric in that paper. If you if you remove um, all of the market risk away, so you hedge it as we as we call it, then it turns out that there is a unique way to um, to do this hedging, and this leads to um, to loss versus rebalancing. Um, I think there is many interpretation to loss versus rebalancing. Uh, I don't think we could finish today if we recounted them. Um, but the critical one is essentially that um, lever kind of measures the the maximum adverse order flow or the toxic flow we're talking about that you you could get as an a, as an as an LP through the AMM. So in this way, it's kind of showing uh, the counterparty that you have essentially how um, how toxic could they be in the worst case. The higher the level, the more sophisticated counterparties and the more competitive counterparties you're going to encounter. They're going to take advantage of you more, and you're going to, um, in formation, theoretically lose more money as a liquidity provider. Um, now, of course, the thing that I commonly like to say is, um, you know, the um, the ups, you have an upside. Of course, you're receiving fees from from all of these people, both arbitrageurs and um, the inf uninformed order flow, everyone. Um, the thing is that having higher lever is not strictly worse um, for an AMM because you might also be getting more of the positive side, um, the fees. So in general, you have to account both for the fees and for the lever to, to actually see in total what your, what your AMM does. Uh, what lever accounts for is only your worst case order flow toxicity. It does not account for um, how much of the, of the upside you might be getting from from fees, from liquid incentives, from anything that, that could um, ever exist. And now as refers to um, uh, the second part of your question, how, how we could uh, measure lever. I think one of, the, one of the most positive aspects of lever is that essentially you can measure it in practice very easily. And specifically, the only thing that you need to do to measure the realized lever uh, so essentially, realized lever is equivalent to delta hedging all of the market risk of your positions. So at this moment, you're going to have um, your position on the AMM, and additionally, you're going to 
um, sort both um, of these um, risky tokens in the case that they're um, both risky um, on an external market, exactly matching uh, your positions to, to the negative um, externally. So this way you remove all market risk because whatever the, whatever the tokens do at its time moment, you always have uh, um, a negative in that, in that position. So that's, that's what's called um, delta hedging your positions. And this is what removes um, uh, the price risk. So essentially, in order to account for this empirically, um, what you do is that every time that you see a trade um, on chain, you need to compute essentially what your change to this imaginary, imaginary strategy that you would do externally would have been. And this change is essentially exactly equal to the, uh, the quantity that the trader bought or sold from, um, from the exchange times the, the price difference. So basically the price that your AMM gave um, to them the average price minus the external market price that you could have gotten in the um, in the external market. So notice that there's always going to be a deviation between um, these two. We said exactly that that's the, the price trajectory immediately before um, the trade, either arbitrage trade or not. And so exactly the difference adjusted by the quantity is exactly what we, um, what we call the loss. So you see, um, empirically after that, you just sum your fees, you see what your cumulative fees are. So you subtract lever from, from these fees and you have the, you have the delta height profitability of the pool immediately. So you only need three, three things. You need to see the external market price trajectory. You need to see the average price trajectory at the AMM and the quantities that are bought on the trades. And then you're, you're calc like it's, it's just a simple uh, multiplication and two subtractions and you, you have the, the final result. So let me see if I was able to follow along. Um, basically, if we want to measure lever, we we look at the trades that go through the AMM and we compare those trades to the spot price of say Binance or wherever the what's it called the wherever the price discovery is happening. We're kind of assuming that it's not happening on the AMM. It's kind of an interesting, if, if we have time, it'd be interesting to talk about like what happens when price discovery is on the AMM, but let's not get, in, get into that yet. So mm -hmm. when there's, so there's, 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 the, there's the exchange where there's price discovery and there's a, the AMM, we look at anytime there's a trade on the AMM, we compare that trade to the, the price on, on, the, on the main exchange. And we can kind of calculate like, okay, well, the... The DAX, so the AMM, let's say, sold it for uh, $101, but the price on Binance was actually $100. And we can look at, okay, well, how much did they sell it for? Well, they sold one token for 100 for 101 bucks. They should have gotten 100. So, so, so they sold one token for 100 bucks. They could have got 101 bucks. So the the lever of that trade would be a dollar. Yes, that's okay. right. If if you have one coin, so how much quantity depends on the curve that you have. It's not um, free for you to determine, um, but that's how you do it empirically. The closed form formula that we uh, derive in the paper is essentially saying, okay, let's think a bit more smart about what the quantity that you buy or sell is um, based on what curve you have, and if we can uh, we can find out based on the curve um, what that quantity is. So you can do that, but empirically there is no need to do that. You have you can see all the data. There's no need to do that. Yeah. Yeah. So so theoretically, if you wanted to like, I don't know, I don't know if you want to forecast a lever, but if you want to do some kind of simulations to analyze your curve under different market conditions and look at how lever would play out, you would, I guess you'd have to like fix the size of the the pool of of resources at some some point, and then fix it fix like the shape of the curve and then you can kind of like let it play out. So you could be like, yeah, there's a hundred X hundred Y at the beginning. And then we just sort of like let, let it run. And then we can, and you, I guess you just assume that like whatever you, 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 you'd have some way of generating a price distribution of price series of prices, whether it's from empirical price data or, you know, some kind of Monte Carlo simulation. I'm not a quant, so I'm, I'm not going to use any more words that I don't fully understand, but, Okay, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm yes. Cracked. So I think um, I think you can also um, 
you can see it in an in, in an easy way essentially like um what's uh what's your dollar loss it's going to be quantity times um price deviation so that's what you that's what you measure and additionally for the for the liquid distribution that you said you can also make adjustments when when this changes like you don't need to assume that it stays constant it's just that every time that it's updated you need to update your base like your base now if 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 more liquidity got added you need to add um as much money was put into um into the liquid distribution at that uh, at that point into the into the calculation so it's it's uh, it's one one more addition it's like nothing more <laughs> gotcha okay that this is starting to make sense to me now and then noise traders come in in the sense that like they're kind of like moving it up and then moving it down. And so they're not actually like, it's, it's basically when someone trades um, and let, let, it's basically like, like the AMM price and the, you know, clearing house, uh, the price discovery exchange price are basically aligned. Someone trades on the AMM for whatever reason. And then an arb trader, like will bring it back or something. And like that, would be like kind of an example of what what would noise trade would look like um, conceptually. So you are getting so so the thing with um, so lever is essentially a worst case bound. It assumes that all of the, all of the trades that you're going to see are going to be arbitrage trades. Um, that's that's what it um, uh, fundamentally assumes. If you have um, if you have some um, noise trades, then notice that this reduces your your loss. Um, and why does it reduce your loss? It reduces your loss simply because the um, the noise trader got harmed, right? So uh, since the noise trader got harmed, you as as we said, it's it's a zero sum game. There is no other way to see it. Um, if the noise trader got harmed, then you got a better deal as a, as a liquidity provider. So the amount by which you got a better deal would be some kind of uh, gain from you. But the the reality is that um, you always kind of see um, arbitrage trades be the largest proportion of trades, or at least allegedly that's what you could see from empirical data. It's like 70 or 80% of the, of the pool trades, arbitrage trades. So this, this, uh, this small 20% of um, uninformed flow essentially does not, uh, does not give you much um, in, in reducing your loss. But you know, lever is essentially um, the worst case thing because we would like it to be a purely informational thing. So what's the worst case um, information that's given away if you only get um, this um, this bad flow, essentially. Yep, that makes sense. It's sort of like, uh, is there a way to cap, is there enough value to be captured from the uninformed flow and a way to mitigate the losses from the toxic flow so that the um, profits, so, so that the, 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 the revenue outweighs the loss and you have a positive profit. Um, yeah, so so it gets added to your fees. So so here, of course, what I'm what I'm brushing away is that in um, in lever, essentially the the implicit assumption is that the arbitrage trades are paying no fees, um, basically. Now, in in recent work with uh, with Tim and Siemak, we have extended that model to um, to the case where the the arbitrageurs do pay um, fees, and in this case, it turns out that for most AMMs and under normal conditions. What happens is that essentially you get some percentage of um, of lever um, back through fees, um, but essentially because you get some percentage of um, lever back through fees, um, it's kind of easy to derive um, in math that essentially uh, fees minus lever still gives you the amount that you would information theoretically lose. It's just that in this case it's now going to be noise fees minus the profits of the of the ARBs. Um, so you're getting some some of the lever back through fees, a percentage of it, let's say, uh, 20, 30 percent, whatever whatever that is, depending on on your conditions. Mm -hmm. um, but essentially, the other one uh, remains there, and they sum up uh, like the the amount that you get back and the amount that you lose. They sum up to um, almost exactly lever. Um, so again, given that you have normality assumptions. If I can jump in just with a, a layman's uh theoretical here it seems like if you're trying to achieve like net positive uh income for for lps essentially what you want to do assuming that you are going to be encountering both t 
toxic flow and uninformed flow is create a fee model where as much of the arbitrage profit as possible is being recouped with the fee. Say so you're you're able to set the fee such that you know 80, 90, 95% of the arbitrage profit is recouped just enough that the arbitrage still takes place. And if you can get to almost net zero and just slightly negative, then you can hope that your remaining uninformed flow pushes you over the top into positive. Is that correct? So that's not exactly correct. And there is, it, it's, a, it's a very nuanced way why that's, uh, that's not correct. Okay. You, kind of, you kind of need um, arbitrage flow. Um, again, remember the comment that, that I made in the beginning. You're not going to get arbitrage flow if they if they don't have a profit to obtain. They're yeah. only incentivized by profit. There is no way that they're going to be there otherwise. But they do offer you something. They offer you updated prices. So if you don't have another way to update your prices, then your prices are going to be stale if you don't have arbitrage trades. And if this happens, uh, then this essentially means that you're also not going to get so many um, of the noise trades or you're going to get one side of the noise trades because the market price is going to be so far um, different that it's only going to be through one direction that noise trades would want to trade with you um, because mm -hmm. you do have very stale prices. So there's actually a very complex interplay here. You need um, arbitrageurs or some alternative way of protocol design to get um, to get somehow updated prices, either a small profit to, um, to arbitrageurs or through um, protocol design. Um, mm -hmm. But you do need that in order to get um, um, uninformed order flow as well. Otherwise, you might also not get uninformed order flow. So was that, that, um, was that kind of understandable? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So. I know you gotta you, you gotta head out relatively soon, so I'm gonna try and get through some some more questions that I have down the down down the line. Okay, so one of them is, it seems like in practice and perhaps also in theory, passive liquidity providers um, tend to lose money and not just a little bit. If that's true, yeah. why do we see so much liquidity on protocols like Uniswap? I mean, some of it's actively managed, but a lot of it isn't. And what, do you have any ideas as to why, um, theoretically or just empirically? I think this is a multifaceted thing that it's not really easy to evaluate. And I will explain now like some of the factors that I consider to be the most um, important ones. So I think there is, besides fees, um, the upside to the liquidity providers is more complex. Um, most of the times they have um, liquidity incentives. So essentially what's called liquidity mining. So other reasons than just fees to participate in the pool. And I think one of those most significantly from the retail perspective, from uh, what I've heard at least, is that there is the possibility of um, future airdrops that are to be considered. So essentially, there are all of these profits that's almost impossible to account for in the mm -hmm. case of airdrops simply because you don't know about them. You don't know that they, ex that they do exist. And so in the, these, these liquidity mining incentives that you get externally and that are um, profit for you um, not coming from fees, um, you should account from, for, for, uh, for all of them in the, in the model. And that's essentially going to be very important for long tail assets. Like this is where this is going to be primarily important. So I think that's the explanation for, um, for long tail and illiquid assets, why, why we see that flow at least my intuition or speculation as to as to why that is, because we can't, of course, uh, know empirically exactly. As, I mean, uh, when it comes to, yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Oh, no, keep going, keep going. Okay, yes, so so, so I think when it comes to um, um, assets that are more established, such as, let's say, um, ETH USDC pairs, um, these, these, uh, these sorts of things, there are two things um, at play over there, uh, or rather maybe even more than two, uh, number one, for these positions that are actively managed, what you don't know is the external portfolios of all of these positions. So you don't know um, whether they have some uh, alternative, more illiquid investments that are um, difficult to manage and hedge. 
And so they wish to obtain some correlated asset exposure. And they do this through, um, through providing liquidity and actively managing it. So you don't, um, you don't know about these, these external portfolios that they hold. Um, and more, um, more importantly, you might have actors that are willing to take on market risk. Um, so essentially, uh, you know, in, when, when we had the, uh, the crypto bull market, as it was called, essentially, uh, you know, it was kind of a, a thing that while the market goes up, your LP position goes up. And it does so automatically without you having to do anything. So you're happy with it. Um, this was kind of an interpretation with it. So again, lever is appropriate in the case that you want to hedge away all market risk. You don't want to be exposed to, um, to price risk and market risk at all. This is when, when lever is an appropriate metric. Um, uh, for your uh, for your investment, sometimes you might want to be exposed to market risk, and you might not have easy ways to be exposed externally. Of course, with um, ETH and um, USDC, you have easy ways to be exposed externally, so that's a bad idea. Yeah. But with um, other assets that are more liquid, you might not have an easy way to be uh, constantly changing um, your trades externally. So it's essentially. Having your position in AMM is an easy way to be rebalanced without having to worry about it as the market conditions change. Um, I think that's um, that's uh, one other reason that's um, that's very uh, very important why we do see um, order flow uh, in these AMMs. Um, so and I think the there's there's a final one I think like it's uh, I think it's a very complex landscape and the final one that I believe is. Um, important for some classes of, of people is that you might want to steadily gather a position in, in, in a token. If you want to steadily gather a position in a token averaged over time, in a, in a time-weighted way, what's called, then having your assets as a, as a liquidity position is, um, is, uh, is a good and easy way um, to have that without um, actively doing things. So you can do you can steadily gather a position in a token by having a liquidity position on AMM. So I think there's so many reasons that um, that basically exist to um, to explain these behaviors, and I don't think we know why which which of these reasons is the predominant one. But I do think that there is a ton of reasons that you um, you would want to um, participate, uh, or that participants um, do participate based on these. But of course, that's pure speculation and intuition. That's that's not based on absolutely any uh, actual information. So that's just a thought process of mine. We we, we won't. We, you're not an expert witness in the court of law, so we'll uh, you know we we'll, <laughs> we we can speculate here. Um, so yeah. speaking of like uh, using LP tokens as a way of hedging positions, um, one interpretation of liquidity provider tokens is to think of them as options, potentially free options given away without, um, instead of charging a premium, you charge like, um, you know, the trading fee. To what extent are LP tokens similar to options? How are they different from TradFi options? And is this, do you think this is like a useful framework to think about LP tokens, at least for certain, you know, use cases? So I think it's one alternative way to think about it. I'm not sure whether the word useful is well defined um, enough to um, uh, to have an uh, interpretation. Um, but basically, yes, I do think that um, LP tokens are kind of um, similar to options in a way. And in particular, you can see that because by, by essentially providing liquid in a CFMM, so seeing as to what I said before that you have all of these um, smart strategies that you might be um, implementing, um, instead of just uh, just uh, um, holding holding a position, um, essentially by providing liquidity in a CFMM, you lock your assets. Like you you make a pre-commitment to a very specific strategy, uh, and that strategy is essentially you're selling the risky asset if the prices increase from from the current level that you LP at, and you're buying the assets if if the price decreases. So you're essentially making what's called a locked investment. Um, in the pool for this time that you're providing liquidity. And there's a million things that you would have done, but you didn't do them. You, you committed to this particular thing. And so um, you lose 
you lose the the optionality of choosing your strategy. This is what you lose. Um, more concretely, the CFMM does behave like a, what's called a straddle position, a short straddle position. In particular, you you sell both call options and put options at the future time that you're thinking that you will yeah. um, um, essentially evaluate your uh, your position. And now these um, these positions they have the the property that they have positive payoffs if this future price is close to your um, your original price. And yeah. that's because um, the seller in this case will collect the premium from, from selling these options, but will not lose much because the price did not deviate by much. So if on the you, other hand, uh, the price, yeah. What you want in effect as an LP, you want two tokens that are both going to increase in value but they're going to be volatile relative to each other while you're LPing, so you can capture the uh, the trading volume. And yet, at the time that you end up closing your position, they have the same price ratio that they did when you first LPed. Is that is that so right? So it, dep it, it depends on what when you evaluate your position. If you continuously um, mm -hmm. um, essentially, it depends on whether you want to hedge your market risk always all the time. Mm -hmm. or not if you want to if you don't want to hedge your market risk all the time and um impairment loss is essentially what uh what you want to uh think about you're you're willing to be exposed to market risk then what you want is essentially um what you said but mm -hmm. if you do uh want to hedge your market position because simply you don't know what the prices are going to do then essentially what you want to do is that you're um you're essentially by these liquidity provider tokens, you're, you're short volatility. So you would really, really desperately want your asset price volatility to be very low, almost zero. Because if it's not almost zero, then you have, uh, you have lost essentially um, lever, which is the time premium that you should have collected. So yeah. I think this is, this is the useful interpretation of lever in this case. It's, it's the time premium that you should have collected upfront when you committed to the LP position, but you did not um, collect simply because you provide liquidity without um, without something in, in exchange. Wait, so you're saying one way to interpret lever is, if you it, from the options framework is, okay, like I'm, by putting my money in this AMM, I'm effectively selling an option or giving this option to the market, basically whoever can exercise it quick, quick the fastest, um and a package lever, of options, rather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and the lever would be it's a straddle option you to to I guess in practice, although you could have like one way trades in the name, but uh, let's not complicate it. Um and the lever would be like, okay, in a in a fairly priced options market, I would be selling this option for a premium. Um, depending on the duration I plan to LP in, and, you know, we could just say like every block, you're basically reselling the option. So like every block, the lever would be the premium you ought to have gotten in a fair like options market. So it would have been um, lever minus fees, basically, like oh. the negative of what your profit would have been. Yeah. With, this is what your um, um, your income should have been. But essentially, this um, this is uh, this is based on if you have a good prediction of what uh, what the lever and the fee is going to be. This, you you rarely have that. Like um, except except on if the time frame is really short, and if it's really short, then you don't really have a good model of thinking about um, how the price behaves because um, at short time frames the price behaves differently from long time frames. Um, so there's there's um, there's, it, it's not, you know, it's not a suggestion to practically use it in any way because it's not, it's not very easy. But over long time frames, it should have been, if you had a perfect prediction, it, you should have collected a, a premium for it. So that's that's the way I, I see it, really. Yeah. Gotcha. That makes sense. So there's a million more questions and topics we, I, we'd love to get into with you. This has been absolutely fascinating, but I know you have a hard stop in a few minutes. And so I want to just like transition to some big picture questions to kind of go through before before you have to sign off. Um, so I guess my first big picture question is, 
do you think DeFi has a long term future, and do you think it can ever compete with like TradFi? Yeah, so I think um, I think you know the the way that I I like to see this is that um, basically um, DeFi you can compare it to digital banking. So digital banking we really like it really did not exist um, twenty years ago. Let's say it was basically almost non-existent. Whereas nowadays, I I believe almost everyone uses um, um, digital banking. So you know things tend to progress um, towards um, um, towards this direction of um, automating um, stuff in general um, in life. Um, but it does take um, it does take a time frame to do so. And additionally, I believe that you know we need we need to do so safely, like. Um, I think one big factor as to why DeFi currently does not have um, a lot of traction and a lot of usage is that there are genuine, in my in my opinion, safety concerns with um, using a variety of um, a variety of things. Like you can never be sure what's um, what's really happening. So I think that um, it's kind of um, necessary that we um, fix those aspects. And I think that um, contingent on on those on those things, it does have a future. Now, if if this does not happen and these um, safety aspects are not are not addressed, um, then I don't think that uh, it's going to be easy for it to, to gain traction because um, from from a user's mindset and you know talking from uh, from myself as a as a user of um, um, banking as uh, as almost everyone, um, I care more about having uh, you know ease ease of use and um, a variety of things uh, that I could do with peace of mind. Uh, so long as they have these two things, I don't really care how exactly um, they're implemented. Uh, on the other hand, if I don't have the option of um, having these two things, then I'm not really sure. You know, uh, the average user is very risk averse. I don't think that um, it would be it would gain traction if uh, if this were not the case. Uh, so okay. you know, it does have a long term future, but contingent on on other things. I, I agree with you there, and if you gotta go, just just stop me. But um, we can my, have a my, couple more minutes, I think. Okay, my my follow up question is, is to sort of play the devil's advocate because I I passionately believe in in DeFi. I think it is the future, but like if I had to take the other side of that argument, I would say, okay, let's say we we fix these security Dark risks spinning. um and all that stuff. Ultimately, what we have with a blockchain is okay, it's decentralized, but like it's it's like a trillion trillion times slower and more expensive than like a server rack, you know, in an Amazon in like, in like a warehouse. Um, in to the extent that like, you know, latency in, in computational complexity are very important for the efficacy of a financial market. How, what is, what is the value added that DeFi has that like these more centralized architectures, you know, are unable to provide, or are there any? I think that this is um, this is additionally something that's um, that's fixed through progress. I don't think that we're in the perfect stage right now, and I do think that we have uh, a long way to go before that's fixed. So I do think that that's something that ideally one would want to address before before you can get um, long term um, long term adoption. It's not really something that you can you can. Uh, just de depend on not having um, a good latency, as you said, or um, um, fast computation and uh, clearing times. Um, if you don't have these things, then again, uh, it's not going to be easy to use. So uh, it leads uh, it leads back to that um, that same uh, that same thing. And now, uh, on in terms uh, to your question, like um, what's the what's the value that's being added? I think the the value that's being added is some kind of um, equitability. Like everyone can have um, access to um, to this system, and if you have appropriate safeguards for uh, for malicious actors that you would not want to um, to actually have um, access to um, to such a system, because these are these are again genuine concerns. Um, I think um, if you do have these safeguards, then I think. Um, it offers uh, transferability. This is what um, DeFi offers. Uh, so it offers this plug and play ability between lots of um, um, financial applications that um, traditional finance does not really does not really offer uh, currently. So that's the value that I see. Yeah, I think to, to sort of build on top of that, it's 
there's like a, a political economy aspect to like these decentralized platforms yeah. where it's, it's like, you know, a lot of times whenever you have an ecosystem where it's like permissionless by default and people can just go and plug into whatever they want to plug into and, and experiment and build off of whatever they want to experiment and build off of, it's you, just a much more fertile environment for like innovation and, and creativity. It's sort of like how, the you know, I don't know if this is a perfect analogy, but like, you know, the reason why uh, movies are made in Hollywood instead of like New York was that like, I think um, Thomas Edison had all the patents for like cameras at the time, film cameras. And he hired all these like tough, tough guys to go and like beat everyone up that was like using cameras without paying him royalties. So everyone went out to like Hollywood in Los Angeles, which was like on the other side of the continent where like, you know, Edison couldn't get them and they started making movies and that's why it's all in Hollywood. And sometimes I feel like a big, a big part of the appeal of the space is, 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 is kind of the, even though it increases the risk is, is sort of a lack of more and more permission to, where, yeah, you don't need people's permission to try things. Um, I think it's kind of cool. I think there are two two things uh, to to unpack right here. Um, first of all, I think that safeguards are pretty important. Like you can you can imagine that you know we don't want humanity destroyed. Um, <laughs> that is an extreme example. Like I can I, I can imagine that's on all of our um, uh, incentive uh, utility maximization or whatever. Like you do have this constraint. Um, so uh, for sure you don't want that. And additionally, you know, you don't want um, generic malice to be um, easy to exist uh, on on any any such space. Uh, so I think that these are factors. Now, with respect to the innovation that you said, I think I also see it from the perspective that for innovation, you also have to have some incentives to do that, because otherwise there is no innovation if you have no incentives to do that. So I think there is um. There's an intricate interaction between having incentives to actually perform the innovation that you perform and having um, um, open source innovation that you that you do. So I think that the interplay of these two things is, um, it's first of all, it's not uh, an easy thing to optimize for. And secondly, it's a Pareto frontier that we can we can work on. Yeah. That, yeah, well, I know you gotta go, but uh, if you, I have, I have a thought that came to my head that uh, unless you gotta sign off, I'll share. Uh, which in terms of like open source innovation and you're right, like you need to have people come up with ideas, you need to have a way of capturing value from those ideas. Otherwise you don't have the incentive to go and push the envelope. One thing that's kind of cool about these like smart contract based platforms is that the intellectual property of like the source code and the mechanism design, et cetera, that can all be open but you can still capture value from it, assuming there's like sufficient network effects incumbent in the smart contract de in, in product deployed in production. So like, you know, even if you wanted to uh, completely fork Aave, for example, I think, I think Aave is completely open source. I, I can't remember, but even if you wanted to fork a lot of these open source projects, like you'd also have to migrate everyone who's providing liquidity onto these platforms and build up that brand. And so you can still, it's kind of an interesting, to me, kind of interesting way of capturing value while keeping the, like, you know, the technology open source, even if, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I can see your point. Yeah. Um, to this, I, you know, I haven't, I haven't thought um, deeply about this, so I'd rather not express a quick opinion on it. That's, uh, you know, it's not of my character to express quick opinions on, on things. Um, but you know, it's something that um, the whole space can uh, can find points on how to improve on. Like I don't, I don't think anyone has seriously thought about um, these concerns um, almost at all um, previously. So um, it's just good for um, uh, for well-intended dialogue to to exist. Just that, yeah. I agree. Cool. So, yeah, I think uh, somewhere here I'll have to go. So. Uh, thank you, Gary, for inviting me. It was great no, to be thank here. Thank you for being here. This was fascinating. Yeah, this we we really glad that we could work it out and connect. We we'd love to have you back on. There's plenty more. We didn't even talk about like there's three other research papers you wrote that were all like equally fascinating as the lever paper. So maybe that's another like three more like 
guest appearances you'll have yeah. to make down the road. Thank you, thank you. But that sounds like uh, too much. You know, we have to actually put up the work for the research to to exist. Sure. <laughs> yes, of course. Okay, well, we'll let you so, go work then. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was great being here, here um, Kenny and Cairo. See you. And we'll be posting Bye. a link uh, to this so people Thank can go so watch much. afterward as well. Thank you. See you later, Jason. Yeah. It was great to have you. Yo, well, it's just us now. Just us now. Always, always comes back to that. Everywhere you go, there you are. Something That's like true. that. Um, well, that was awesome. I'm yeah. really glad we put that together. That was, oh, uh, was that through Elisa? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Kudos, Elisa, if you're, if you're listening. Thanks Shout for Elisa. It's um, making me even I more excited. I had things to, to mention. I, I'm sure you could tell, Kenny, I was sort of inching toward the idea of the premium pools there. And I think that what I said may have not come across clearly as far as minimizing arbitrage profits while still leaving enough on the table that they're willing to engage in their behavior. That's kind of the balance you need to strike, I think. Um, yeah, I think also, in my experience, there's, there's, a, there's kind of a different way of communicating in sort of academia versus non-academia like a non-academia it's like are we like are the words roughly accurate that's kind yeah. of like the standard but in academia like the, 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 the there's the nuances of the communication are like very I, important i feel like jason gave us an all-timer today he said something like um i don't think the term useful is sufficiently defined <laughs> I'm gonna have to, Jason. If you're if you're watching this part of the uh, of, of the podcast, we're gonna I'm gonna be borrowing that from you. Yeah, that's uh, a very polite way to say no. Uh, <laughs> well, it's 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 a polite way of saying something. Yeah, um, yeah, or or kind of. I don't know. Um, I, I I respect that, especially when the stakes are so high. I think that there's a lot of There are a lot of questions, um, you know, about incumbents and incentives and essentially asking, well, what are the upsides that square this when it seems like people are losing money voluntarily? And to some degree, I think there's just like the, the noise of life in crypto that stops people from being super efficient with their um with their money i mean if you go look at the deactivated shelby one pools there's still a couple hundred thousand dollars of liquidity in there uh, which is you know down it's like less than five percent of peak but it's still a lot of money and i don't think you can really make an argument that there's some very deep game theory reason for leaving money in there i think people just they either forget or they lose their keys yeah you know um you, I guess you could make the rational argument that if you are so rich as a whale that the time constraint of migrating off of Shell V1 will cost you more than, than moving your money. It's also possible that those are all shrimp and the fees on mainnet would exceed uh, the money they would get back. So that does add some stickiness. But... Uh, I, I mean, know. I feel like the gas cost isn't going to be like can't be kind of be less than like 500 bucks. Right. And that, that's like, like it has to be way less than five, probably way less than 500 bucks. Yeah. And I don't think that hundred grand is just like, was like 2000 people putting in 500 bucks. I don't, I feel like yeah. that's, that's, I don't think that many, I don't, I don't think there's that many wallets left. Um, it, this made me wonder because I, again, I'm, as I said, I don't know where I said this was at the last mind meld inclined to think about things in terms of like end user products. And so when Jason's talking about like, oh, you want to like essentially short the assets that you are LPing in order to get rid of your market risk. I'm thinking, okay, how do you turn that into like a product? 
in terms of can you package short positions plus LP on tokens into one token, you know, and let people essentially buy like a market risk neutral LP. And then if you combine that with a net positive, uh, you know, AMM model, that actually could be something that makes money. So funny you mentioned this. So I'm this is getting me hyped for I don't know when when he's coming on, but we have Guillaume Lambert from uh, I think it's Panoptic. Oh I yeah, believe. this is the month of big brains. Yeah, uh -huh. I'm trying to. I'm looking at. I'm trying to find. Look at our schedule and see when when he's coming on. Um, uh, no, I should have it. Um, looks like it is the 27th of June. Yep. Oh so hell yeah! That is Tuesday after next. Sweet. All right. Well. Oh, I'm really psyched for that one because that that's going to sort of, we kind of like where we were heading with Jason before he started running out of time was really going directly into, into that subject. I mean, it'd be great to have both of them on at some point, but that would be cool. I'm really psyched for that. That one, I think, um, <clears throat> you know, Guillaume's a super smart, super smart dude. He's been thinking about this a lot. Uh, you know, I'll be honest. I, I have my skepticisms of, of, of how viable just vanilla LP tokens as they're currently constructed will be as a way of creating a, an options market. But I'm also like, I don't think I didn't really know. Like I'm not, I wouldn't consider myself, you know, talking about how to construct like, you know, a bonding curve in practice. I feel like I kind of understand that relatively well. Talk about how to construct an options primitive out of LP tokens in practice. And I just, you know, I have a lot of opinions and not a whole lot of like hard built theoretical or practical knowledge. I think the, the, the for me, I think the question that I have or sort of like the skepticism I have is from, like you are saying, like, could you hedge the price risk uh, and still collect the LP fees? I just, I feel like, in practice, the price risk, the, the cost of hedging that price risk will outweigh the revenue you get from, you know, the LP trading fees in practice and most, most of the time. Obviously, that won't be true. You can find instances where that won't be true, but just if I, Kenny White, given my, like, you know, lack of financial sophistication, tried to do it, I would probably lose money um, most of the time. It seemed to me, and I'm reading into him way more than he would want me to, so sorry, Jason, <laughs> but it seemed like in implying a solution for Lever, um, one thing that that he got close to was the idea that if you can find an alternative way to keep prices aligned with the market that is not being subject to arbitrage, then you don't have to pay them their cut um, in exchange for their services. Um, the ugliest way to do that would be with some kind of Oracle pointing at centralized exchanges. Um, but at that point, you're really just like an extension of that exchange, you know, uh, and you sort of get away from like the DeFi principles. Um, yeah, I mean, if it makes money, it makes money. Like, yeah. uh, I think there's a couple of problems with with the Oracle approach mm -hmm. and beyond just the, you know the violating DeFi principles. It's just Okay, problem number one is that Oracle, you're, the Oracle is only as good as its, a, as its latency 
from from like you know the the price discovery like clearinghouse like binance basically in practice yeah um and and really what it may really really what it, what it comes down to is does that oracle update its prices on chain faster than the mev bots are able to like arbitrage you and um i don't know i feel like that's that's kind of an open that's kind of an open question uh, i mean you can you, I, i'm not saying that you can't improve performance with an oracle i'm just saying like that's that's a limitation and then another limitation is uh okay if you have like a decentralized oracle or decentralized ish oracle where you have a bunch of uh agents reporting prices and you you have a way of you know penalizing them if they report a wrong price um and rewarding them if they report a proper price you know if you have a i think that's like chain link works something like that okay well the more like you know people you have reporting prices and the more the you have to resolve like discrepancies the you know i i would say in practice the the more latency you're going to have with that with that oracle and so if you know the, the fastest oracle is going to be just a centralized completely centralized oracle but then it means you got to trust this person which maybe that's okay maybe it's less okay um you know thinking about and this is not a constant but just going off what jason said about uninformed flow making up 20 30% of volume in that case you essentially go okay to end up net positive for lps we need to have we need to be bringing in at least five times as many fees per traded dollar on uninformed trades as we lose from ARB trades, you know? Yeah, I'm hearing Jason's voice saying like, well, you're getting revenue from the ARB trades from the fees. So if you take the revenue, the, the, if you take like the, the lever and subtract from the lever, yeah. the fees you're getting, you got to get five times more fees from un exactly. uninformed flow than that amount. Yeah. So I guess the question is, will arbitrageurs still be willing to do their deeds if what they walk away with is essentially a fifth of whatever the uninformed trade fee is? And my initial thought would be yes. Um, I guess that's for them to decide. I think Yeah, I mean the way I've sort of been thinking about about it with like our our premium pools is it's like um if you can't beat them join them and it's kind of like okay well the analogy i use is uh all right so just to set up set up set, set up like the, the problem in my head is these arbitrage traders they're just kind of the way i think of them is they're just a lot better and more sophisticated and faster than you're going to be as a liquidity provider. Yeah. Um, at least as a passive liquidity provider. And there's just no way around that. And if you ever happen to find a dumb and unsophisticated arbitrage trader, he's not going to make it. He's going to get out-competed. Yeah. And you you really, like, you're not you're not trying to beat the the average. You're, you're trying to beat the best because the best are the ones that are going to be, that you got to worry about. Yeah. And you just... And so... I think back, I think this was in like the Middle Ages or the Renaissance period. I think it was like a fairly common practice where, you know, the king wanted to collect taxes, but his kingdom was like too big and he lacked the like bureaucratic administrative capacity to go and like 
actually figure out how many taxes to collect from every freaking town and region. And so what they would do is they would find, you know, people who had local knowledge of, of an area, um, like a baron or like a merchant or, or whatever, the king would then, uh, that, that person would then buy from the king the right to collect taxes from that region. And so the person collecting taxes could do a much better job than the king because he knew it. And the king was making money because this guy was paying the king. And the guy paying the king, he would pocket the difference between how much he paid the king and how much he collected in taxes. And so this was a way for the sovereign to collect tax revenue relatively efficiently, but not need to figure out how to build an administrative state to do so. And by analogy, like if like the passive liquidity provider is kind of like the king where he has this store of capital and he's willing to put it up and use it for other people to trade against. Mm -hmm. But he wants to get fairly compensated for this capital, but he really isn't so good at like the, you know, block to block, minute to minute, second to second, like arbitrage game, which is kind of what you need to do if you want to be competitive as a market maker, at least in TradFi, that's kind of, if you're a market maker, that's what you need. And so what you can do is you can uh, tell like an arbitrage trader, hey, look, you pay me some money and I'll let you, you know, use this capital, I'll let you set the trading fee basically for each swap. And the catch is that you can, cl you collect the revenue from that fee. And um, I wonder if that method, that model would work. I mean, it basically comes down to, can you charge, do you, how do you know how much uh, the arbitrage trader should pay you for that right to collect fee revenue? Well, I think that you have them? to have an auction model for that, right? Yeah, like this just is like what kind of an auction model? How do you implement it? Um, these are all things that we're kind of thinking about. And I think the other thing, like, if you were willing to accept a hundred percent of your orders being arbitrage, you'd have a lot more options as far as how you set up your auction. I think one of the biggest things to consider with something like this is how do you set up an auction that maximizes the value capture from the arbitrageurs without ruining the retail swap experience with that same pool, right? Because ultimately those retail swaps are gonna be what gets you into the positive. Um, whereas only serving the arbitrageurs will ultimately get you very, very close to zero while still being negative, if I understand correctly. I think, yeah, so I think that's one of the problems with like a lot of dynamic fee models um, that I've seen is that like they're kind of usually designed with the assumption implicit or explicit that all the trades are coming from arbitrage traders and we're just trying to make sure that we don't give that we don't like lose we're trying to minimize how much we lose from these arbitrage traders but like but like Jason was saying these arbitrage traders are actually pretty important because they keep the exchange price efficient and they're in line with like the broader market. And so when you have these fees that kind of penalize arbitrage traders, they often disincentivize uninformed flow. And so you end up still losing. And I think, yeah. I think that's kind of like one of like the kickers is, is, and I think I, I'm not an expert, but I think theoretically it's, 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 they, they assume it's d difficult, if not impossible in theory to discriminate between like toxic flow and uninformed flow. Oh no, I don't think that that's a worthwhile pursuit. Um, you know, it's, I guess one thing, and this is just me not understanding the world of MEV and, and like block by block arbing, but depending on how quickly you could conduct these auctions, I almost imagine like 
a pool that has this like repeating fee staircase where it starts at like 90% and over the course of like X time steps down all the way down to like, you know, 0.25 and then restarts. And if you are using the retail app, the app just waits until the end of that, say, 10, 20, 50 second, like, staircase and puts your uninformed order in when the fee is cheap. But if you are doing arbitrage, you're competing, essentially, to be the first past the post for this trade, you know, against everyone else while the fees are higher. The thing is, then you end up slowing down the retail process, you know, it becomes a worse experience as far as the swap time. I think also, you know, if, if, if the fee resets back to say 90 or whatever, every, yeah. every, after every trade, then you could be waiting a long time as a retail trader before you, the fee is low enough for you to make a trade. Oh, I, I, I wasn't saying after every trade, I was saying it just goes like on a time-based or a block-based cycle regardless of the, the trade flow. I don't know. Um, I'm not a DeFi engineer. Well, the nice thing about uh, DeFi is that you can kind of theorize all you like, but you can also just build and see what happens. Yeah, you can also just deploy it and be like, well, here we go. <laughs> um, well, I think we're... We're, re we're we're reaching that critical point in the podcast where we've been rambling long enough and we've been talking long enough where we've like deviated from anything that looks like an area of our exp expertise. That's true. Um, so let's uh, maybe maybe for the sake of like um, you know people replaying this five years from now, let's let's like re 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 let's rein it in. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh... Uh, Anything shell related we we want to want to get out get get out of the way I guess obviously we got hacked yesterday sorry guys it's oh uh, yeah uh, totally our Discord me. got hacked to be clear yeah yeah the Not smart contracts on the app are completely safe the Discord was hacked I got fished someone pretending to be from a news outlet defiant totally duped me and um, feel very ashamed about it and I feel really awful that you know seems like a few people clicked the malicious link and uh, I'm really sorry guys it's done it's totally my fault yeah I think that one of the best things we can do now is just sort of write up a post-mortem as you said Kenny because I think it's better probably for these strategies these hacking strategies to be well known by everyone even if that gives ideas to other aspiring hackers it's probably net net better to inform the community so I don't know. yeah so look, we'll look that. for that do you think we should put that on uh, as like a discord post or should we like make it a blog post what do you think i was wondering whether it should be a whole blog post i think i think a discord announcement is sufficient um yeah and and maybe we can do it on twitter as well yeah um but yeah, that sucked. Um, I'm glad we were able to recover everything as quickly as we did. Um, and uh, yeah, I, you know, we keep moving forward. I think if you are ever unsure about communication that you're seeing from an official company channel, um, which I guess would be Twitter or Discord, go check the other one. Because my hope would be, unless it's some sort of insider attack, it, there would be a very low chance of both of those being um, compromised at the same time. So, uh, yeah, we'll do our best. Maybe we need a third official line of communication so that we can have two out of three. You know, we can still have like... Like a communication multi-sig. Yeah, exactly. Because otherwise, if the Twitter and the Discord, like, if someone very sophisticated takes control of one, they can be claiming that the other one was hacked. You know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> True. So, so then you get like a like a who do you trust issue. Not to give anyone ideas. Um, 
But yeah, maybe we should have like a third third wave to it. Yeah. We'll think we'll look into it. Yeah. Um I think in terms of features, I believe we might be releasing multi token NFT swaps today. Oh yeah. Uh, Ishan has been working hard on that. That'll be cool. You'll be able to just go from any two tokens to any one token and include NFTs into that. Um, it's very right? cool. Yeah. I'm I'm kind of smiling because I just, first of all, I, I just think it's really cool just to be able to, just, just to have the flexibility to convert whatever asset you want into whatever other asset you want. And not just one asset to another asset, but like a vector of assets to another vector of assets. And we're slowly building out more and more flexibility into the system. You know, first we just had multi-token swaps for fungible tokens. And then we had NFT swaps. Now we have multiple NFT swaps. And right now it's like two to one or one to two. But, um, you know, down the road, we want to add, like, not just two, but many to one and one to many. And eventually, we'll do many to many. Uh, these are not hard from a smart contract standpoint. It's really just, like, the order routing and, you know, UI, UX standpoint that, that takes time. And we're also, yeah, looking into sort of features that will really amplify this. And um, as we build out more overall features into the shell app itself, um, yeah, it's going to be really um, I want to say very briefly regarding um, Uni V4, completely putting aside any of the uh, practical details, it's, I think it's pretty validating uh, for the idea of the ocean contract to see Uniswap taking this approach. Um, from what I understand, they tend to synthesize good ideas um, once they've kind of been proven out in their in their design. And the fact that they believe in a single contract model reinforces what I already believed, which is that this is, as we said, the future of DeFi, and that we essentially have like an 18-month lead on uh, on this model. And we've had plenty of time to, you know, put in the work uh, battle testing it, you know, in the field and, and getting familiar with it. So who knows, maybe premium pools will show up in other protocols 18 months after we deploy them to, you know. But uh, I feel like we're on the right track, uh, just in general. Indeed. Indeed. Well... All right. I guess, that's, I guess that's it. Yeah, I certainly feel like I've talked enough. Um, awesome to have Jason on. Wow, thank you, Kenny, for moderating that. That was really cool. Yeah, well, yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry to sort of hog the uh, hog the interview a little bit, but just no, dude, please. Of course, and, uh, for everybody watching after the fact, listening after the fact, um, thanks for tuning in thanks for sticking with all of this if you ever do want to attend a future episode live you can always come in and ask us questions on our discord while we're talking and um yeah don't don't be strangers okay see you guys Aloha.